Okay, we're gonna start. She says 40 seconds. Ooh, I'm tired. I need some sleep. You've been listening to Gerald Finzi's Five Bagatelles for Clarinet and Piano, Opus 23, played by clarinetist Emma Johnson and pianist Melvin Martineau. We have just done the first part of the song. It's from Zhukka Faizi, Wei Da Ling Guan and Gong Hong. The first part of the song is the first part of the song. The second part of the song is the first part of the song. The second part of the song is the first part of the song. The time right now is coming up to 22 minutes past 8. It's a Thursday, and that means Howard Elias is in the studio. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And you've been, uh, again, uh, camping out in various <laughs> At the cinemas. Summer, yeah. <laughs> for the Hong Kong International Film Festival. Yeah, and, and I miss it. have seen lots, lots, lots of films. And, and last night I wanted to see... About some of them. Yeah, not all of them. And then last night I was telling you off air that I tried to see a film at 10 o'clock last night, and it was... Full, yeah, it was sold out. They said front row only, and I said, "Oh, forget that! I'm not going to sit in the front row." <laughs> so I went home and had an early night. Well, planned to have an early night. It just didn't work out that way. But oh well. You were busy writing your review. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what I was doing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's hear them. Okay. Well, before I get to that, I'll just say there are some big films opening this week, which I'm not talking about. There's Steven Spielberg's Ready Player One, which is uh, based on a book of the same name. I have not seen it because I've been busy at the film festival. That's opening. There's Pacific Rim Uprising, which opens today. Um, it, I've not seen that one either. It sort of looks like Transformers 24, but it's not getting good reviews. And the other big film that is opening today, very very much uh, apropos for the Easter holiday, is Mary Magdalene, starring Joaquin Phoenix and Mara Rooney. Now, interestingly, I had wanted to see this film, but the distributor did not have a uh, press screening for it, which only tells me that they know it's garbage. <laughs> and in fact, it has been released in the States and it is not getting good reviews. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't surprised. But I I wanted to see it because I thought it would be a hot mess and, you know, maybe it is. So that's what I'm not... Just out of curiosity, you must go. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I'll, maybe this week I'll try to see it. The other film, which I did want to talk about, is a German film which played at the German Kino Film Festival back in the fall, and I did review it, It's and it was supposed to open today. It's called uh, My Blind Date with Life, True Story. It was based on a true story, and uh, I, I loved that film. I thought it was a wonderful little film, and it was going to open commercially today, and just the other day I got a, an email from the distributor saying, no, they pushed it off to next week. So um, I'm not going to be reviewing it, but um, it will. I will. it is on my website um, I, which I'm not going to mention the name of the website because we can't talk about things like that on air. But if you want to search for Howard Hong Google, Kong film, you well, you we can't even Google say the word that. Google, you right? Google, you know, yeah, yeah, so you, we have you to... You could search, search for Howard Elias and you'll, you'll find yeah, the connection. Just do Howard so. film Hong Kong, you'll find it, all right? <laughs> so the film is called My Blind Date with Life and it opens next week. It was supposed to open today, it opens next week. All right, now let's talk about the film festival and um, I've been seeing lots of films. I'm going to talk about films that are going to be screened again in the coming week. So you will have an opportunity to see them again, hopefully, if there if there are tickets still available. I think there are. Or you might have to sit in the front row, you know, see what happens. But do try to check them out. The first one is a Russian film called Loveless, and it's by the same director who made the 2015 Golden Globe uh, winner for Best Foreign Language Film, called Leviathan, which I reviewed here on this show, and I love that film. Did, did I review it with you or Jonathan? Must have been Jonathan, I guess. Really powerful, powerful film. And this is also, it's a story about Putin's um, corrupt Russia. And and needless to say, with Leviathan, the, the Russian government, which actually um, financed the film, was very upset about the film. <laughs> When, it, when they saw oh, it, yeah. yeah, and this one, I don't know if they financed this one, I can't imagine they did, and they were probably just as angry when they saw it, because it does sort of take a nice swipe at Putin and, and the corruption that goes on there. And the story is, it's about a couple, Jenya and Boris, they're a middle class a couple whose marriage is coming to an acrimonious end. And both of them have already begun new relationships. She with a wealthy, older divorcee, and he with a younger woman who's already pregnant with his child. 
And now they have to deal with selling their small apartment and deciding who gets custody of their 12-year-old son, Alyosha. And neither of them wants the boy. Oh. Yeah, and their feelings on the matter are quite clear, especially to the boy. Yeah. Um, now, one morning, uh, instead of going to school, Alyosha runs off, never to be seen again. And as much as Jenny and Boris would like to move forward with their new lives, they have to work together to find their son. Now, this is, um, as I said, this really takes a swipe at, at Putin's corruption and corrupt Russia. He, the director, his name is Andrei Zvyagnisev. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, but that's sort of, it's got a lot of consonants. Yeah, it's got a lot of consonants. He makes it clear that he's not impressed with what has become of his country or his countrymen. Uh, these people, Jenny and Boris, are very selfish people. They care more about themselves, and certainly than their son, and even their new partners. They don't care. They're just interested in themselves. And uh, yeah, very. <laughs> Stacy's shaking her head, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's quite sad. And um, it seems interesting. There's one scene where Boris discusses with a work colleague, uh, Facebook Live. Oh well. Um, how he's going to lie to his to his employer that he's getting a divorce because apparently in Russia the religious conservatives are as powerful there as they are in Trump's America which who knew you know? so uh, very interesting you learn a little bit about Russia now the film spends a lot of time and perhaps too much time in the search for Alyosha and we hope that he'll be found safe and alive but we realize that even if he is. Um, what kind of life is in store for him with parents like that? And the answer to that question is revealed in the film's epilogue. So it is, um, it's a bit of a sad film, a bit of a downer, but um, supposedly realistic and uh, very powerful, good performances, well-made film. So it's called Loveless. It's screening again on April the 1st. Check it out if you can. Perfect cycle. Yeah, really, yeah. Yeah. Second film is called Foxtrot from Israel. Now, who would have known that idiotic politicians can even be found in Israel? <laughs> right? <laughs> They're everywhere, even in Israel. Now, when it was announced a few months ago that the Israeli Film Festival in Paris would open its festival with this film, Foxtrot, Israel's outspoken culture minister named Miri Regev, she ordered the foreign ministry to boycott the event. And she even threatened to hold future financial support to the festival if they show this film. Now, very correctly, the festival organizers said, screw you, <laughs> and they showed the film anyways, which I would have done the same thing. I don't know that I would have showed the film, but anyhow, if I had already made a choice, I would have stuck with the choice. So I, I support the organizers of the Israeli Film Festival. But not surprisingly, her actions only made people more curious about the film, and it received, it's getting more attention and a wider distribution than it would have otherwise. And um, maybe that's why it's here at this festival, because of all the attention. Now, it's directed by a fellow, an Israeli fellow by the name of Samuel Maoz, who made the 2009 award-winning film Lebanon, which I actually didn't like, but it was very well-received. And he also is not a fan of his government or its military. And this film also takes a swipe at his government. It should be noted that uh, Israeli, the Israeli film industry is notoriously anti-government. Um, it's, it's a, you know, Israel, thank goodness, has, fr like Hollywood, yeah, like. right, yeah, you know, Israel, thank <laughs> goodness, has freedom of speech, yeah. um, so they, well, ex with the exception of Miri Regev, they do let their, their, their filmmakers make the kind of films that they want to make, mm -hmm. uh, with free of government interference, generally, <laughs> generally, and this, this director does take advantage of that. Now, the story of Foxtrot, it focuses on a couple who has to deal with the news that their son has been killed in the line of duty which is a big deal in Israel because there is compulsory military service. Now, if there's such a thing as karma, Michael Feldman, who's played by Lior Ashkenazi, who's in a, he's been in many, many films over the years. If you don't know his name, you certainly know his face. Um, he may have just gotten his karma because, as we learn in the story, when he was young, he broke a family tradition. And now, as an adult, his mother has Alzheimer's and she doesn't know who he is. He's in a fragile relationship with his wife and his son is now dead. So he's, you know, karma is really coming back to him for what he might have done. Uh, to say any more would be revealing too much, so I'm not going to say anything more. But I will say that he gives, Ashkenazi gives a powerful performance as somebody who's learned to sublimate his feelings, to, to tamp down his feelings, to tamp down the truth. 
And when the truth and the feelings do bubble up to the surface, it's devastating, not just for him, but for everyone else around him. Now, the metaphor with foxtrot, you know, foxtrot is a dance step. Mm -hmm. It's a box step. Mm -hmm. And the metaphor is that you can move in different directions, but you always end up back where you started. And so um, it's a very poignant message. And, um, you know, with, with, especially with the director who's really focusing many of his films on uh, Israel's military relationship with its neighbors, um, you see that, uh, especially in, let's say in Lebanon, that 12 years after the Lebanon war, it looks like Israel might have to go back to war with Lebanon at some, you know, in the future because Iran is arming Hezbollah, who's on the border. Um, let's not get all political here. But I think his point is that it's all going to repeat itself. So it's, you know, it's like a dance step where you just go in circles and you start back at the beginning again. Now, as for Mrs. Regev, who uh, was all uh, tied up in knots over a certain controversial scene in the film, that, see, that, that just does not happen. So when, if you do see the film and you go, oh my God, I can't believe the Israeli military does X. They've never done it. They don't do it. It's a metaphor. So she needs to chill a little bit and... Um, you know, just take the film for what it is. So that film is also playing again on April the 1st. So I would say I I didn't love it. I thought, okay, I, I respected the, the craft of the film. It was an interesting uh, message and well acted. Eh, okay, you know, it was, it was, you know, certainly I think if she wouldn't have said anything, the film would have disappeared. Mm -hmm. But she said something. So April the 1st, second screening. No such thing as bad publicity. There's no such thing as bad press, for sure. Believe me, I know that. <laughs> now, a third film, which I saw yesterday, and it's playing again on April the 3rd. This actually is my favorite film so far of the festival. It's called Lucky, and it stars the late Harry Dean Stanton, who, tr who sadly passed away last September at the age of 91. And he passed away just two weeks before this film was released commercially in the States. I'm sure he saw it because it did play at film festivals for a few months before that. So I'm sure he saw it, but he didn't live to see its commercial release. Quite sad. Now, it tells the story of a 90-year-old atheist and his struggle against encroaching old age. Now, just... Aside from, let's leave the story for, for, for a second. Let's talk about Harry Dean Stanton. If you don't know who he is, and I can't believe if you don't, the man has been in over 100, 100 films, or he was in over 100 films, made over 50 television appearances. He was in films like Alien, Repo Man, Paris, Texas, The Green Mile, and, of course, Twin Peaks. And even the new Twin Peaks he was in that was on the air last year. Um, so... Again, if you don't know his name, you certainly know his face. Um, so he's been around. He was around for a long, long time. Um, wonderful, wonderful actor and sad that he, that he left us. But I, watching this film, you know, he's 90 years old, or he was 89 when they made the film. He, he moves so well. Or he moved so well for an old man. I mean, there's a lot of scenes where he's walking, and he's, he, he had so much energy at that age. I thought, wow, I hope, I hope if I live to be that old, I hope I have as much energy as he has had in the film so um that's this that's his personal side but you know lovely film about this man who who is um you know as i said he's an atheist but he's starting to have uh spiritual feelings or maybe he always did and now they're you know again they're coming to the fore the film features a rich roster of character actors and many of whom were his friends uh longtime collaborator david lynch who made twin peaks um, he's in the film. Ron Livingston, who people might remember as, um, I think he was one of Carrie Bradshaw's boyfriends on uh, Sex and the City for many, many years. Uh, Ed Begley Jr., who was in St. Elsewhere, and he's been on countless TV shows over the years. Tom Skerritt, who was in the TV show Pick Offenses and was in Alien. Now, Tom Skerritt, i got to say, the man is 85 years old, 84, 85 years old. Wow, he's that old. He's that old. He has a full head of hair. I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, he looks great. Um, and you're going to love this, 50s heartthrob James Darren. Do you remember James Darren from the yeah. Gidget movies? Oh, I'm yeah. sure you do. Oh, Gidget is a very, very, very distant memory. <laughs> I was very young for Gidget. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I, I'm sure if you look him up, James Darren, you will remember him. So he was, you know, girls fell in love with him in the 50s and the early 60s. He also, I had to look him up, he's also around 80-something years old. He must have the best plastic surgeon in Hollywood. He looks about 65. And they, like he looks a good 65, not like a plastic 
Enhanced 65, you know, surgery oh enhanced 65. God. Looks it's fantastic. In the jeans. It's in, oh it's my god, he, he looks amazing. Okay. So really a wonderful, sweet, sweet film. Really, and I say this was my favorite film of the festival. Opening, uh, playing again on April the third. And no more, no more about the plot. That's that's basically the plot. He just he 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 struggles against getting old. And and there's a wonderful scene between him and Ed Begley Jr. who plays his doctor. And Ed Begley Jr. says, you smoke three pack or you smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, you know, and, and you know, you don't have a great lifestyle and yet you're as healthy as an ox, basically, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the genes. It's in the genes. And then, you know, the doctor says to me, he says, I can tell you to quit smoking, but that'll probably do more damage. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you've been smoking a whole lifetime. And your body will, will just, like, go into uh, shock. shock. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. So, um, you know, it's quite, it's quite a good scene. So, um, really a sweet, sweet, sweet film. Really enjoyed it. The last film I'm going to talk about, and I have a lot more, so if you want to read more about some of the films, Check out my website. I won't mention the name of the website, but you can search for Howard Realize. Hong Kong. Yeah, Howard Hong Kong film. film. Yeah, is a Lebanese film called The Insult, which was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. It did not win, um, but I thought it was going to win. And it's a story about uh, Lebanon and its many problems. Now, Lebanon was once hailed as a synthesis of East and West, and in fact, Beirut was called the Paris of the Middle East, right, by many people. But um, in the recent decades, it's been bogged down with uh, internal ethnic strife uh, that has spilled into politics. You know, the president was assassinated many years ago. Uh, they had a civil war that lasted 15 years. There were multiple wars with Israel over the years and very, very high public debt. It also has a refugee problem because it has, um, it has uh, Palestinians who... Um, the first group of Palestinians came from what is today Israel, and the second group came from Jordan. Jordan kicked them out in the 70s, and they went to, to Lebanon. And apparently the Palestinians make up 10% of the country's population. And now they have Syrian refugees who are fleeing the civil war there. So they have to deal with so many issues, and they just can't seem to get their head above water. So, but not given this whole situation, not surprisingly, and perhaps sadly, there's little sympathy for the Muslim population, the Palestinian population, coming from the Christian Lebanese community, who see their Muslim neighbors as the cause of their country's economic and uh, political problems. Now, this is made, written, co-written, and directed by a fellow by the name of Zia Dueri, who did a film a few years ago called The Attack, and as I said, it was nominated for a foreign language, uh, foreign language film Oscar. Foreign, foreign language film Oscar, that's right. And it's a fictional tale of two men. One is a Christian Lebanese and the other is a Palestinian refugee. And they cross paths one morning on a suburb in Beirut. Now, the Christian Lebanese fellow, his name is Tony Hanna. He lives with his pregnant wife in a very modest apartment just down the street from his car repair business. And their neighborhood is undergoing redevelopment or you know, gentrification, as we might call it. And the wife would like nothing more than to move to someplace quieter. But Tony says, no, we're staying. My business is here. It's just down the road. Here we are. Here we are. Now, on the other side, you have Yasser Salameh. He's the Palestinian. He's a foreman working on one of these construction projects on Tony Street. And after Yasser instruct, instructs his workers to fix Tony's leaking drain pipe without Tony's permission, the two men get into an argument. Tony insults Yasser. Yasser throws a punch, breaks two of Tony's ribs, and everything just spirals downhill after that. And the situation only gets worse when Tony and his wife end up in the hospital a few days later. So now Tony wants justice, not just for him and his family, but for all the Christians in Lebanon who are angry over what they believe the Palestinians, the Muslims, the Palestinians have done to their country. So this is a real ethnic, uh, racial strife film. Now, sometimes uh, this film plays like a mediocre episode of TV's Law & Order, there, you know, there, there, you know, there's a, the second act is really the courtroom scene, and it's, yeah, it's okay, it's not done great, but there are a few surprises along the way which are really well done. I have to give the director credit for that. But all in all, the film is an interesting portrait of identity and ethnic 
relations, ethnic, ethnic relations, in this troubled and complicated corner of the world. You know, for us who are on the outside, we might not understand or see the difference between these two groups. We might paint them with the same brush. We say, you're all the Lebanese, what's your problem? They see the difference, and that's the problem. So it's a it's a it's an interesting perspective and, and a good education, you know, to see what goes on in other countries. Because we also, you know, here in Hong Kong, we see the difference between us and our mainland cousins, but the rest of the world says you're all Chinese. What's the, what's the problem here? So I think there's a lot of parallels there. So um, I actually, I don't, this film has already played twice, I don't, but it will be coming to Hong Kong. Um, it has been picked up by a local distributor, so it will end up in the cinema. I don't know when, but uh, certainly check it out, called The Insult. So that's all I'm going to talk about. There are a lot more films I could talk about, but Stacy's giving me dirty looks. So. I am not. <laughs> I am not. You can't see me, but I am not. He's just making that up. <laughs> and uh, so next week I'm not here because of the public holiday. So have a wonderful... I will be. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, have, so you should be. <laughs> have a wonderful holiday. Well, maybe we'll do it on the phone. Yeah, we could. We could. Okay. okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Talk to you later. Okay. Probably Thanks. next week. Okay. okay. All right. See Bye. Ya. Bye.